Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Schilling. <laughs> so, <laughs> here's what we're going to do. Uh, Mark once wrote, interviews with people you know well can turn awkward if you try to be the probing questioner instead of the coffee shop companion. So, I want to be the coffee shop companion. Okay. The book, of course, that Mark has just published about his last 20 years um, writing about films in Japan is called Art, Cult, and Commerce, Japanese Cinema Since 2000. Um, I have 20 questions. I'm not going to ask them because we are running already a little bit late, and I want you to ask questions. But I'm going to start with a couple for Mark. So the first question is this. Why did we just show a Jun Ichikawa film, and why is he so important to you and to Japanese film? So for me, the uh, discovery was a film called Dying, in the Ho- Dying at the Hospital, uh, which was um, released in the early 90s, 92, 93, I think. And uh, I saw it, again, like just going in pretty cold not knowing too much about the director of the film or anything. And I was just totally blown away because has anyone seen it to die at a hospital? You have seen it. Okay. And I ended up showing it at Udine. You know, we uh, we selected four films. And I saw it uh, with Ichikawa-san at Udine. And uh, again, I was blown away because we're watching patients in a hospital, they all have cancer. They're all being treated for cancer. And uh, in the course of the film, you watch their treatment, you watch how they uh, interact with the people around them. And you also see scenes of people outside the hospital, you know, doing ordinary things, playing with their kids, going to a festival, playing baseball. And that combination, you know, people in the hospital, or the patients in the hospital who are going to die, and the people outside who seem very much alive are not going to die, at least anytime soon. You know, the contrast just hit me so hard that, you know, you're, you're in the middle of life, but you never know when it's going to stop, when it's going to end. And uh, I showed that film with today, and, and believe me, the last 10, 20 minutes, Everybody in the audience, the tears were just coming down. And I couldn't stop myself. I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there by the director. And my, my face is just red, you know, glistening with tears, right? And we go out and he said, I feel kind of sorry. You know, I, I just make films to make people cry. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's not only that. You know, he was kind of joking. But um, I thought, okay, this is... It's got to be one of the best films, not just from Japan, but from anywhere that I have seen, you know, in the whole time I've been watching films. So that clued me into what he was doing. And I ended up seeing everything that he made after that, every film that he made after that. And I went back and saw the earlier films as well. So he became like my touchstone. You know, this is why I'm doing this. You know, at that time there were other directors, you know, coming up. You know, doing interesting work. Um, you know, Kitano, Kurosawa, later Kodieda, Kawase, uh, and so on and so on, right? And I thought, you know, great for them. You know, they're getting the recognition they deserve. And I thought, wait a minute, Ichikawa, he should be up there with them. You know, I mean, he was not being ignored. <laughs> he was not being ignored. You know, he had, he had a very... I think uh, you have know, good reputation in Japan. He won prizes in Japan and outside Japan. You know, but I think he could have taken a step up. You know, beyond Japan, and um, I, I tried to do what I could. You know, by writing for the Japan Times, and I thought this is my mission. You know, to make his film better known outside Japan. So um, when I had the chance at Udine, you know, I was the uh, advisor for the Japanese for the uh, Japanese film program I said we, we have to bring him and they said who's Ichikawa Jun I said he's this great director and I thought actually for Udine at that time it was a little bit of a, an awkward fit because 
at that time we were doing a lot of popular films, commercial films, you know, any kind of like kung fu and uh, <laughs> horror and uh, all all these commercials, which you know was not bad. It was like we were showing people in Italy and from elsewhere the kinds of films that Asians were watching themselves, but were really not that distributed widely outside of Asia. That was our mission. And I thought, let's bring him, you know, it's kind of, um, you know, an exploration, like a discovery for the people in New today. And I think it really went over well. It went much better than I thought it would. So I thought, okay, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay? Thank you. Wonderful answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a little longer than I had hoped <laughs> But maybe we'll just cut out 15 or 16 of these 20 questions and um, uh, let's, 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 so I think you've, you've answered um, that one. Since you mentioned the four Ks, Kurosawa, Kitano, Koreeda, Kawase, who do you think are going to be the next, you know, the next generation of directors um, that everybody outside of Japan knows of. Yeah, there are younger directors coming up. I mean, by this time, okay, the 4K directors are no longer young. I mean, they're, all over, they're over 50, all of them. And um, the ones coming up right behind them, you know, for example, Fukata Koji, is in his 40s, I believe, right? And Nishikawa Miwa. She's getting up there in her 40s, right? So they're not young directors, but I think, you know, they're ready to take that step as well, you know, to move. Like, Fukata's film was selected for Cannes, you know, his new film, which I haven't seen yet. Um, yeah, there are several. What's that? Kawase, too. Kawase's yes, film was selected. Yes, her film as well. Yeah, her yeah. film was chosen for Cannes. So, yeah, they're um, taking the next step and... Um, yeah, I'm waiting to see what's going to happen. We were talking about another director at dinner, um, Okita Shuichi, you know, who uh, I really like. And um, we've shown six of his films at Udine. And believe me, every single one of them has been a hit with our audience. And uh, he's another one, I think. If, he, if the word got out more, he would be right up there. But, yeah, he's, he's also like... Kind of on the verge, you know, making making his breakthrough. I think so. Yeah, there are several like them, and of course, someone like uh, the way to Shinichiro, you know, the director of One Cut of the Dead. <clears throat> that was another discovery for us. You know, we showed his film in 2018. We were the first international festival to show that film, and I first saw it like in January or February. Like nobody knew anything about it, and I thought. We have to get this. This is a brilliant film, you know, for anyone, you know, not just our audience, but anyone. And um, I brought that, and I thought, oh, my God, you know. So he's another one. Everybody's seen this? One Cut of the Dead. Okay, go ahead. Yeah? Yes. He's another one, yeah. 1,000 times its budget at the box office. 1,000 times. 1,000 times its budget, huh? He made it for (laughs) $25,000. Okay, next question. Anyway, yeah, please. Uh, Excellent. Next question. Which director list. besides Juni Chikawa do you wish had gotten greater attention? No, you know what? You've just answered that question. Which films do you wish had gotten greater attention outside Japan? Because, of course, we're talking about people reading Mark in English and going to film festivals and seeing them there. Film or films? She took away my answer. I was going to say Ichikawa again. <laughs> you know, he's the reason I'm here tonight. Because uh, I wanted to show everyone his best-known film, you know, Toki Tani, Tani. But he has many others. Another one like that is Obayashi Nobuhiko, who is also, you know, a very successful director of TV commercials. And he became uh, well-known abroad for a film called House. Okay. And uh, he's another one I started tracking way back when. He made a film called uh, Beijing Suica, uh, Beijing Watermelon. came out in 1989. I reviewed that 
for the Japan Times, and I thought, again, this is somebody, I went in kind of cold, not knowing too much, and it just struck me as just totally uh, brilliant. You know, the way he, he confronted, he had, he had a problem because he was going to film in China. You know, he was going to take everybody over to China to film. It was about Chinese students in Japan. And, of course, you know, they end up going back to China. But Tiananmen Square happened. He couldn't do it. <laughs> he had to cancel, you know, this flight, his shoot. So what he did was he created a mock-up of an airplane, and he just staged the whole thing. He, he just plowed right ahead and, and filmed what he wanted to film. But, of course, it's just like a, a stage set, you know. And I thought, my God, you know, this guy's got balls and he's got imagination. And I, I kept seeing that in his films again and again and again. And he, he had a film, Hanagatami, which you showed here. Another one, Labyrinth of Cinema, that screened at the uh, Tokyo Film Festival last year. And it's in cinemas right now? Uh, yeah, in Japanese cinemas right now, be, one of the few... It's going to be in, in the cinemas, right? And it's the last film he made before he died. He died of cancer. And when he came to Udine in 2016, he was still healthy. Thank God, you know, and then shortly after that, he was diagnosed stage four cancer, right? And he ended up making two films after that. And the last film, Labyrinth of Cinema, just blew me away. You know, this is a film made by a dying man. You know, it has more energy in it than many, many, many films made by people, of course, healthier and, and younger, but not as brilliant as um, Obayashi. So um, he's another one. I think people know House Abroad. But they should know many more films by him. So that's another one. Okay. Which director do you think has gotten too much attention? <laughs> she slipped that one in. I didn't, I didn't see that one coming. Huh? Who, got too much, who got too much attention? Uh, that's a hard one to say. Huh? Yeah. I mean, really, Japanese directors don't get that much attention anyway. <laughs> you think they do. But, you know, even somebody like Miyazaki... You know, when his film started going abroad, you know... Hayao Miyazaki, I think everyone knows, Prince's, right? The Prince's animator Mononoke, right? of Ghibli. You yeah. know, the biggest, at that time, 1998 or 97, the biggest hit ever in Japanese film history, okay? And then it, it's uh, <laughs> Harvey Weinstein bought it for his company, you know, and they're going to show it, show it in the States. And they thought it was an art film. I mean, that's the way it was regarded. You know, his films were regarded as art films. And... Um, Unfortunately, you know, in the beginning, they just didn't get out there that, that much. You know, he's so huge in Japan and, of course, in the circles of, like, anime fans abroad. But even somebody like that, you know, compared with, say, Pixar or, you know, Disney, you know, is still, like, kind of on the margins. So, yeah, who's, who's really too big? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> All yeah, right, it's your turn inflated. because I could go on and on, yeah. and Mark could go on and on. <laughs> Who would like to ask anyway, a question? Yeah. Just throw your hand up, and a microphone <clears throat> will magically appear. Sorry. Rob? Well, I have two questions, but I know Karen won't let me ask two, so I'll ask one. Okay. Um, I want to ask about this film that we just saw. Uh, obviously, it's very powerful and uh, very, very well made, but... I feel like it's about loneliness, and it makes you feel incredibly lonely. So why, yes, Tony Takutani, yes. so why, why do you like it so much that this film is so effective in making you feel extremely lonely and isolated? But that's the kind of time we're living in now, isn't it? And you got to Isn't see it? it with a whole bunch of people. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, we, we, we were talking earlier. Um, I believe Mr. Chikawa mentioned, like, one of his images or inspirations was uh, Edward Hopper. Right? And I thought, oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, Edward Hopper, of course, was well known before all this started. But now he's like the, uh, the artist of the uh, coronavirus era, you know. <laughs> right? And, um, again, it. I saw this film way back when, you know, when it first came out, 15 years ago, and I had a different image of it. Okay, I thought, okay, it's from a short story. It's even told like you're reading a book. 
And there's just narration, narration, narration. And at that time, I was thinking, well, maybe it's not cinematic enough. You know? And then I, I saw it again. I realized everything fits together the way Ichikawa intended it to. You know, the music, the images, the acting, everything it fits together. And I think it, it all, for me, it all built up to that scene where his wife is gone. He's, he's alone in that huge closet. Really, it's just a room with all of her clothes, okay? <clears throat> and I thought, in my own life, I've had that experience of, you know, somebody dies, you go in, you know, you see their things the way they left them for the last time. And you never forget that. You know, you, you never forget, you know, the, uh, the, the feeling you have, the, 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 smells, the smells you have, all that, right? And um, I thought, okay, that just sums it up. You know, the absence you feel when somebody dies. And that's just like the perfect metaphor. You know, she had these clothes, rack after rack after rack, but they're fading away because she's fading, fading away in his memory. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it works for me as a film, but also like almost like a visual poem. Next question. Oh, yeah, Matt, Matt, you had a question, and then Johnny will take you. Yeah, um, Mark, I wanted to ask a bit about the book, um, <laughs> which, which goes back to 2000, is that right? The book goes back to, starts in 2000, right? Yeah. Um, um, what was the question? Oh. <laughs> so going back and looking at your reviews from that, from 20 years ago or or. Um, even maybe your reviews from before this book, um, reading those again, um, how did it feel to to look back at stuff you'd written 20 years ago? Oh, the reviews I wrote 20 years ago. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, when I wrote an earlier book, it's that white one on the, uh, on the table, the contemporary Japanese film, that was 10 years of film reviews going back to 1989. And the publisher at that time told me, they're too long. You know, if you want to get all those reviews in the book, you're going to have to cut them down. I said, oh, I'll cut them down. So I spent like a month, maybe two months, going over every single review. It was agonizing. <laughs> Thinking, oh, my God, I wrote that? You know, it's like, <laughs> thank God I have a second chance. I can go back and... I thought he meant it was agonizing because it was so beautifully done he didn't know how to cut it. No, the bad ones, right? This book was not as bad. You know, I went back. No, the big difference was at the beginning of the millennia, I had much more. I had a a thousand words to play with, or 1,200 words sometimes. Now I have 550. Okay, so for this book, again, I had to cut I wanted to cut, you know, down from 1,000 if I could, you know, to get more reviews in the book. And I thought, okay, maybe for me, 550 words is better. (laughs) I'm I'm kind of joking. It's not really enough. It's not enough. But what it forces you to do is compress your thoughts, try to get everything in there in a very, you know, short space. If If it's much shorter than that, it's almost like a capsule, you know. So maybe somewhere in between there, like not a thousand, not five fifty, maybe seven fifty. But that was my revelation, you know, that um, I, I was fighting, fighting, fighting for the word count. Every time they cut me down, I was like, oh my god. But now I realize maybe it's not so bad, you know, in some ways. I, I think lots of journalists uh, feel the same way. Johnny, yes, next question. Yeah, it's sort of off-the-wall questions. So I'm taking advantage of you being here. But um, in your opinion, in my opinion, I've never seen, uh, and I don't know if it's possible, but in your opinion, has there ever been a good film about Mishima? Oh, Mishima. Yeah, because Western attempts to capture it, they you've miss seen, out. You've seen the uh, Paul Schrader film? Yeah, yeah. You've seen the Paul Schrader yeah. film, okay. There's a new documentary out, you know, with Mishima debating with students from the University of Tokyo. Have you seen that one? It was shown here. Yeah, it was shown here, right? 
I saw it, of course, here. I saw it here. And also on um, <laughs> my PC. <laughs> I saw it. Anyway, that, that's another one I think is really worth seeing. Because oh, I'll, I'll connect yeah. you to that, Johnny. Maybe that's but that's not a, you know, that's a documentary. It's not <coughs> a, I think you're asking about a fiction film, maybe? Or are you asking a film written based, based, based on his life? Okay. Oh, based on... Right, and you know that Mishima, Paul Schrader's Mishima, of course, was banned here. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you seen the Wakamatsu Koji film? That's another one uh, about the end of his life when he had his um, private army. You know, they took over the uh, GTA headquarters. And it's called The Day He Chose His Own Fate. Committed suicide. Yeah, that's... Uh, it's another one we're seeing about him. Because, yeah, Wakamatsu, of course, is from that era. You know, he just knew all the uh, the characters. He knew the uh, the era, everything. Right? So it's worth checking out. Yeah. Matthew and then, and then Phil. And <laughs> okay. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on Matt's question with another question related to the book. So, Mark, so I know from personal experience editing you that you were putting the book together in 2019. And, of course, this seems like a lifetime ago now, 2019, before coronavirus and everything. Yeah. Um, but you were, at that time, you were reading your old reviews, um, essays that you'd written about Japanese cinema as well. And looking back on them, I was wondering if your opinion has changed or if you disagreed with what you thought in 2007 or if you found something that maybe now you love because of the changed uh, context that we're in there. Oh, you mean films that suit, yeah. suit this era? Or, or if you... Or that you changed your mind. Yeah, did you change your mind at all? changed my mind about it. Yeah. Mm, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I see films, you know, after a long time, and I realize I like this too much <laughs> the first time around, yeah. Or the other way, you know, when, when you see something in it, you didn't see before. And I think that was the case with Tony Takitani because when I first saw it, <clears throat> I hadn't had that experience in my own life of having somebody close to me die. And then I did, you know, in the 15 years that followed. Right? So I think uh, seeing it again, I thought, okay, it's, uh, it's a very artistic film. It's a very minimalistic film. But... It's a deeply emotional film, too, you know, and um, I don't think I realized that quite as strongly the first time I saw it, you know, so. Um, what about in a in a bad way, though? Have you <laughs> discovered, oh, my, why did I say this was such a good film? And actually, it wasn't because if you're like me, you're a lot more cynical than Mark Schilling. <laughs> And, but, you know, you appreciate yeah, no, that he's a cheerleader <clears throat> for Japanese film. And um, and it's a very important role. But sometimes you think, God, too yeah, much, Mark. I, um, <laughs> no, no, there, there are ones, okay, for example, for example. I, I have, I have, I'm given five stars for the Japan time frame. One star is... I guess I could give zero if I wanted, you know, but five stars is the limit. And I think in, in ten years, every decade, I give maybe two or three five-star reviews. That's it. You know, I, I look back on the uh, five-star reviews I did give, and I think sometimes, oh, <laughs> I really shouldn't have done that, you know. Now, there's one I haven't, should I actually say this, you know. <laughs> called Sakuran. Sakuran, right? Do you know that film? Oh, yeah. I liked it. You know, and it was based on a, a manga by a woman, directed by a woman, starring, of course, um, the great uh, Anastasia. <laughs> and it was set in the, uh, you know, the Yoshiwara section, right? 
where the uh, concubines ruled. And it was set in that world, the world of the concubines. And um, again, I saw it and I thought, oh, my God, you know, it's like the ultimate feminist film. And I'd been looking for something like that, you know, like women had been like working so hard, you know, to make any kind of mark in this industry for so long, you know, in Japan, right? It was so tough. And then it seemed like, wow, this is the breakthrough. And um, I said, okay, it's got to be five stars. And uh, I thought about it afterwards. Is it really a five-star movie? Mm. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe okay. Not. <laughs> Phil? But this, this Sheena Dingo did the, um, the score for that film. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. yeah, good music. What that, did you think of the film? Good music. Okay, four, okay. another yeah, score, another <laughs> Phil. Four, five stars. Phil. But anyway. Okay. It anyway. may be one too many. Maybe one too many. Anyway, I want to thank At Mark least. a lot for showing this movie. Okay. I've seen it. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, I've seen it two or three times in Japanese. It's the first time I've seen it with English subtitles. and. Sakurai? No, no. The oh, Tokyo this film, Tony, yeah. Which is... It's one of my favorite Japanese movies of all time, and and oh, you, oh, it's yeah. actually yeah. the first time I've seen it with Japanese sub oh so with English subtitles, English so yeah. it was kind of special. So I thank you a lot for doing that. Um, but um, in that in that vein, I want to ask you about my personally favorite Japanese director at the moment, which is Hashiguchi Ryosuke. Can you talk about him? I, mean, I don't. I don't know what you talk. What you said about him in your in your book, but can you talk about him at all right now? Three stories of love. Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite. That's probably one of my, my favorite, favorite Japanese one of my movies favorite films of, of the last ten years. I think. Yeah, that's one. Did I give five stars? I think I gave five stars to that one. <laughs> But it's What's the Japanese it. title of that again? It's it's What's like Koibito Tachi. Yeah. Koibito Tachi. Yeah. yeah. Where you know you have three different stories, and when when you see a film like that, it you know usually you're like one section or one segment is stronger than the others, and um, it doesn't usually hold together as well as you know just one story. But in this case, I thought they all worked wonderfully. You know. You know, especially the one of the um, uh, the heavy set guy who's testing <laughs> the bridges. You know, he has that talent. You know, he can find the cracks in the bridges just by listening. And um, of course, he has a tragedy in his own life. You know, his wife dies, and um, that's another one where I thought it was workshop. Okay, I I don't think I interviewed him for that, but I you know read about it, of course, and. He had to spend a lot of time with these actors getting what he wanted. And I think with that one actor in particular, he didn't have that much experience. And um, he had to go through this long process before he got the emotions that he wanted, right? But when he got it, it was just like, you know, he nailed it. He just totally nailed it. And um, that's another one. I just, I walked out of the theater and my face was just like... <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I, I haven't really seen that. It's very rare to see that kind of strong feeling in a Japanese film. And unfortunately, not, Hash, Hashiguchi-san no. hasn't made a film since then. He's so, always been very slow. You know, he's made like eight films since, not that many, you know, huh? the 1980s. <laughs> but... Yeah, he goes he goes way back, you know. But um, I thought, okay, he's the gay director, and he's been that <laughs> he's held that position for too long, right? There should be other gay directors out there. But um, again, uh, when I interviewed him, have you ever talked to him? I met him once. But I didn't see him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He um, he went through this period. He had a nervous breakdown. He went through a period of severe depression. He was going to kill himself, you know, and he came out of that and he made a film called All Around Us. I think the uh, Japanese title is Guru Dinokoto. Have you seen that one? That's another one. It just like it just it killed me. You know, just Mark, 
Why are you Why are you talking so much about sad films tonight? Because I'm being asked about <laughs> sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's talk about happy films. Okay, yeah. let's let's try to. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Another question from the audience. Yeah. Um. Do okay, Matt. Yes. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned um interviewing. I want. I was wondering. Um, how do I make this not a two-part question? Not get get in trouble. Um. How has your interviewing style changed over the years, if at all? And how have you, um, for people who don't know, a lot of these press interviews are often 20 or 30 minutes. And I'm wondering how you, how you, what's your strategy to get the, the uh, best out of those 20 or 30 minutes? For interviews then. Uh, interviews. Yeah, interviews, um, used to really intimidate me. <laughs> I, I would like, I, I couldn't sleep, you know, like, for days before an interview, right? and uh, I got over that somehow. But um, my strategy, if it, if it is one, um, I read everything I can about the uh, the person. I of course see the film, make just doing all the standard stuff, you know. But the one thing I I don't do that a lot of people do do is, is make que- a question list. Okay, I'm, I'm on the train to the interview. I've done everything else, and I'll sit there and I'll scribble out ten questions. This is because everything's been kind of percolating in my head, and this is what I want to ask him or her. And um, I get that. I take that to the interview. I never look at it. I have my question list with me. It's kind of a safety blanket, right? I never look at it because my object is to start a conversation. You know, the director answers my question. I hear something that suggests another line of questioning, and I'll just jump around. You know, like, from one, I don't have a list I'm going down. And I've seen so many, like, stage interviews, you know, where the person has, like, a clipboard, you know, question one, question two, question three. And I, how boring. You know, you, really, you know, like, you know, you never get to the point of actually having a conversation. You know, and, and of course, a lot of directors have, like, a script in their heads, I know that, you know, and I'm not really against that. You know, they they prepared what they want to say, and somehow they're going to get that in there. But, like, when I interviewed Kalasan, <laughs> it was actually in a good, a good situation. We met in the coffee shop, and um, he suggested the place, you know, I said, fine, you know, I'll be there. And as soon as we sat down, the next table filled up with these, like, middle-aged ladies. <laughs> And it, you know, blah, 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 blah. And the, the silverware's clanking and, you know, and all this stuff, you know. Like, I was kind of like this. But it made me pay attention to what he was saying. So I just, like, focused like a laser. I mean, my ears weren't good even back then. And, um, yeah, we managed to have a conversation, I thought. And um, that's my strategy, you know, to kind of get them off the script, you know. There's a lot of really great interviews in this book and some um, several interviews with the same director, which is also a great way for Mark to, you know, continue a conversation over the course of several years. So make sure you get the book. Yes, sir. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Um, do you have anything on um, documentary? Um, a documentary. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, mm. Maybe you don't like uh, Moritatsuya or no, no, the one. Yeah, uh, documentaries I do whenever I can. You know, sometimes um, what can I say? One just pops up. Is it's, it's so important for some reason? You know, like uh, Hara Kazuo, um just did a documentary called Leiwa <laughs> Ishin. You know, about the uh, the last, it was not this election, but or the most recent, but um, before all this started, like a year ago. More yeah, than a year called ago. Reira Uprising in English. Reira Uprising, yeah. right. And um, I thought, oh, my God, you know, he's a brilliant director anyway. And um, it was shown at the uh, Tokyo Film Festival last year, right, four hours long. And uh, I sat through the whole thing. Well, Actually, there was an wasn't, intermission. It, wasn't it longer than that? 
Maybe a, <laughs> it was only four. Okay. Four hours. I, okay. I thought it was longer. Than and uh, I just sat transfixed, you know, throughout the whole thing. And he's one director that can do that for me. Uh, the one he did before that was about the asbestos cases. Okay. Which we showed here. We had him here for that. That's another one. It's just he spent years, years, years putting that together. And um, I thought, again, he's trying to be objective in some ways, like listening to what they're saying. But he also has a point of view. Okay. And he, he's trying to get underneath their surfaces. Okay. So he's really not their friend. He's not always their friend, right? He's making a film, and he's going to do what's best for the film. So for me, someone like that is equal or better than, you know, any, anybody working in fiction films. You know, what he does in the documentary field. And so, um, yeah, he's one, like, one of the best. Since you, me. you mentioned this with documentary, which is a good question, how is it decided which film, you, you, you can only do say 50 reviews a year 50 in a year. the, in the Japan Times. So 50 a year. there, there were 700 films released in Japan last year. Um, so how, how in the world do you decide which ones you should review? Mm, it's always, um, Difficult because I have to go down. I have to do it at least a month in advance. You know, they they give me um, a deadline, like you know, please send in your list. So I'll go over. There's one site I consult that has all the um, films coming up, say in the month of July, and of course I'll look at every single website, look at the trailer, and then you know, it takes a day or sometimes, right? And I think, oh my God, you know, some of it's just like, please. <laughs> My time on earth is limited, right? I, I, I'm to the point now where I don't want to see a film I know I'm going to hate. Two hours, please, you know. And very often they're, they're directors I, I really admire or young directors who seem really interesting for whatever reason. And I think, okay, that's the one, that's the one, that's the one, that's the one. And, okay, four in a month out of how many? You know, 600 films were released. You know, Japanese film were released last year, and I can't, I can't cover them all. You know, it's too bad. We have another d reviewer now, James. Yeah, yes. James, and we also have Matt, who's doing and all of the, the anime. anime. Yes. So yeah, thank God I have help. <laughs> you know, we're covering as much as we can. You know, but you know, she was she was kidding me. Actually, not kidding me. Oh, you're so easy. And I, wait a minute. You know. If I did like Roger Ebert did, you know Roger Ebert, right? The American reviewer. I, I met him. I loved him. The first him. Pulitzer Prize winning film critic in history, please. He, he reviewed From Chicago. <laughs> His goal was to review everything that came out. Okay? And um, he, he just about did it. You know, he managed to do it. But, of course, he's seen so much crap. <laughs> he even wrote a book. I hate, 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 hated this film, you know. So, uh, yeah, I'm not in that position. You know, I'm, I'm trying to see the ones I think I'm going to like, you know, more, more often than not. Next question. Yes, Kent. Wait, one moment. Yeah, we are talking about good and bad films. Yes. I wonder, are there any kind of keywords that has to be in a film like, you know, this and this and this is a good film? How do you decide what's a good film? Oh, decide what's a good film. Yeah, not, like for example, now you said the first time you saw this film, uh, <clears throat> you thought it was good, but yeah. then in 15 years something happened, and then your your own personality changed, right? <clears throat> so yeah. it's like you know when you ask a, <clears throat> a painter, you know, uh, why is this painting good, or, why is it uh, good, or, or an art critic, you know? Yeah. But when you ask the when I when you ask the painter, he said, well, it's because of your experience, you like maybe this painting because you see. Sometimes I see something in the painting, and you say, "I never, I never draw that," you know. But you see yeah, it. Yeah. So, it, how much is how much depends on the person's background and experience, and 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 what are the kind of clinical keywords that has to be there in a good film? Ah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Huh? Yeah, yeah. 
who was it? Their famous critic, Manny Farber. Who, who said, I'm going to just paraphrase here, remember the exact words. Okay, like the, the critic watches the film, but the critic is also a man. Okay? The man watches the film. Of course, he was writing this like many, many years ago. He should have said the, the man and the woman, right? Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> You're watching this film as, as, as a person, you know, not just as a critic. So, um, yeah, that all, I don't try to hide that. You know, if something uh, connects with me on a personal level, you know, like I've had that experience myself where, you know, I thought that myself. I felt that myself in some way. Uh, probably the best example. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to tell another kind of dark anecdote. But um, have you seen a film called Harmonium? Fukata Koji? Fukata Koji? Okay, that's another one of the greatest films coming out of Japan and who knows how long. But there's a scene in that film where, you know, the uh, the character played by Furutachi Kanji, you know, he's, he's the uh, metal shop owner and goes into the river to try to rescue his daughter, right? And he comes out and he just, he just freaks out, you know, and... Um, I thought, you know, maybe if I had seen that film without, you know, knowing anything about that situation, I think he's overacting. He's overdoing it. And I thought, but I have been in that situation because there's a time in my life when uh, uh, it goes way back, like maybe 40 years ago, I was on my bicycle going over a bridge in my uh, my hometown, little town in southern Ohio, and um I saw a motorboat making a sharp turn in the river, and I kept riding. I heard people screaming from the river, and the, the boat had overturned. So I had, well, I didn't have to, but I, I went to the bank, took my shoes off, jumped in the water, and I swam out to where the boat was. And um, there was a woman with a baby, two, an older couple, and a young guy, probably a teenager, and they're all like screaming their heads off. They're saying, get the baby, get the baby. And the mother had a baby in her arms. I thought, wait a minute, she has the baby. And I realized they were, they were, they were pointing to the water. You know, the grandmother had been holding this two-year-old girl. The girl had fallen into the water. I didn't know that. But I, I went into the water. I came up. I went in. I came up. It was very murky. I couldn't see like two feet in front of my face. And uh, I couldn't find the baby. And in that time, you know, the, uh, the teenager started swimming to the shore. He couldn't make it. None of them could swim. I found out later they couldn't swim. They had no life jackets on. So he gets about midway in the river and starts drowning. You know, he's, he's going like this, you know. So I swam out to him. You know, I'm a trained lifeguard. So um, I brought him to the shore safely. One of many talents. <laughs> I brought him to the shore safely, and then they brought the grandmother to the shore. And she was beside herself. You know, she was, I think at that point, she was insane. You know, she was just screaming, screaming, screaming. And I, I thought, you know, she'll never recover from that. You know, that kind of experience. And I saw that in the movie, you know, Furutachi performs, and I thought, for whatever reason, he understands that. You know, like the character he's playing will never be the same after that. Never be the same. So I thought, you know, that's one case where because I had that experience, <laughs> I could say, okay, you know, this person, you know, understands. He gets it, you know. So that that's all. You know, it's just one of those rare occasions when, you know, you can connect to a film. Okay, let me try to turn this around. So do you have a guilty pleasure Japanese film? Just one of those guilty pleasure. My guilty pleasure? Yeah, that's (laughs) like such a bad film, but you love it. Um, My guilty pleasure. Actually, it's not a Japanese film. (laughs) I shouldn't even say this. Nobody's going to buy my book now, but... um, (laughs) 
I'm, I'm a fan of kind of stupid comedy. Let's put it that way. And, and in some, like the Three Stooges, you know, like when I was a kid. Nobody watches them anymore, man, or do they? No, but you know, you got to be a baby boomer, man. The Three Stooges. But there was a film that came out in that tradition, Dumb and Dumber, Jim Carrey. <laughs> Jim Carrey. And what, what's his name? Jeff, Jeff Daniels, man. Oh, my God. And I, I laughed at that thing from beginning to end. Yeah, because I just, and, I happen to hate the film a but lot. Know, but uh, that's okay, because and, I and rarely were, agree with Mark and people about talk, films. <laughs> what a but, ridiculous film. How could they even, like, yes. it's, it's terrible. Yes. You know, if you like that film, like, you know. <laughs> they made I, a part two, yeah. right? <laughs> Um, that's, so my that's guilty okay. pleasure. Right? So anyway, so that's okay. Everybody has um, everybody has their guilty pleasure. Their hang-ups. Are there other questions? And anything else? In? Anything else that? Oh, yeah, Rob. Because yeah. we're running uh, out of time. Okay. Oh my God! I think you'll great. like this as a last question, Karen. Thank you. Maybe this this time. feels like a family reunion, <laughs> so I'm going to allude to our grandfather, Mark. You were you were very very close to Donald Ritchie. Uh, Donald and you, you've talked about how he was a big influence on you. Yeah. So if you could talk about how he was an influence on you, how he influenced your conception of film analysis, or oh. also if you have any Donald Richards stories that you'd like to tell, that would be it, wonderful. Within five minutes? I mean, okay, Donald Ritchie was my friend, my mentor for about 20 years, and um, he really encouraged me when I was just starting out. So I owe him for that. I mean, I could never repay that debt. But more than that, I mean, he would, uh, we would go to movies together, okay, and talk about them afterwards, right? And, um, you know, you're the opinion of Donald Ritchie. is like, this is like the pronouncement of God, right? I mean, <laughs> he has no doubts about what, he's, what he thinks about a film. So, you know, there's that, but. I think more than that, we would see films together at his house, you see. He would invite me. He lived in Ueno. He had this little apartment overlooking Shinobazupan. So he had, you know, his collection of DVDs. And um, they're all, like, of course, great films. And um, he would suggest, like, okay, do you want to watch this, this, this? i say, mm, okay, how about this one? He'd say, no, I think we'd better watch. <laughs> anyway, we, we would come up with a film to watch. And um, we ever in his apartment, he had a little TV. <laughs> like you're, a monitor. He's exa- he, he's he never hooked it up. <laughs> no, it was, ten, it was 30, 35 inches. No, no, no. When I, was, when I first started seeing films with him, it was not that big. <laughs> <laughs> he got a better one later. But he would pull this thing out of his o- Oshide. You know, he kind of opened the Oshide, and there's the, the monitor. The thing was never hooked up as a TV. And he, he put the DVD in. And all he had in that apartment to sit on were these straight back chairs. You know, not even like this, like this, you know. And um, I thought, you know, I can't slump and I can't, I can't sleep. I've got to pay attention. Donald Ritchie is here. We're watching this together, you know. And um, I swear to God, I mean, watching it with him. You know, in the privacy of his apartment, I paid attention to every frame, every frame. And at the end, you know, we're sitting there, we can talk about it for an hour or two. You know, because I think he gave me that gift of attention. You know, that you're just not, I mean, please, you know, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still pretty degenerate in the way I watch, in the way I watch some films, you know. But when there's one worth paying attention to, yes, you know. I think it's really worth it to, to really nail, like, every frame. Like, when I'm doing a review now, if I can, you know, I get, say, a DVD or whatever, and I'll make notes. You know, like, I end up with 10 or 12 or 15 pages of notes for every film. And that I think that comes, like, from his influence. Like, you know, you're paying attention to the music, to the editing, to the uh, camera work, to the acting, everything. So, um, I mean, just to hold, like, I wasn't trying to, what can I say, be Donald Ritchie, just hold my own in a conversation with him, you know. So I think I had to bring my best game. That, that's what he gave me. 
And the book has three essays on Wait. Donald Ritchie Donald that are Ritchie. all wonderful. So please be sure to read the book. And in order to read the book, you should probably buy the book. And anyway. so the publisher will go right over yeah. here. Did you want to finish with one last thing? Uh, no. Thank you for coming. <laughs>